Hey all here, OS Reviews. You're watching our video review of the Yuma Digi A9. This is a budget Android smartphone that sells for around $100, making it quite affordable. Runs on Android 11, which is pretty up to date, and also comes with dual SIM support, so you can pop in two nano SIM cards, supporting 4G LTE bands globally, such as AT&T and T-Mobile here in the US. So it seems like quite a promising value on paper. So let's take a closer look at how well it performs in this video. So starting off with the design, the screen here measures 6.5 inches diagonally, has a 20 by 9 aspect ratio which is very modern, and overall has pretty small bezels for a budget phone. There is this larger chin at the bottom here, but for what it is it still looks quite sleek and immersive as you're interacting with content. Even though the phone is a little on the large side, it can still be held in one hand, although it does have a HD plus resolution which is 720p and not full HD or something crazier in terms of resolution, however it's fair again for the price range. It is a IPS LCD panel, so it does have pretty good viewing angles and visibility even if there's some light around you is still decent as well. It has a teardrop notch which houses a 8 megapixel front selfie camera along with the earpiece and in terms of the body of the phone it is constructed out of plastic or polycarbonate. It is a unibody finish which means the back cover is not removable so it still feels quite sturdy and strong. It doesn't feel cheap or hollow either despite the plastic build. Now, we have a few different color editions available for this phone, including this blue version that has kind of an interesting glistening gradient effect as you are reflecting it on the light, which I do appreciate. One of the benefits here compared to, say, glass is obviously doesn't attract as much fingerprints, so it remains pretty clean. Although, despite the low price, they also give you some extras in the box, including a TPU case if you want to give it some extra resistance. One unique hardware feature is there's a customizable button on the side that you can map to open up any application, whether it's tapping once, double tapping, or long holding. For example, just using this key to trigger the flashlight, open up a certain app that you use frequently. It's an interesting hardware function. And there's also the SIM card tray that also supports a micro SD card that can be used to expand the built-in memory. By default, the phone comes with 64 gigs, which I think is pretty good for, again, a budget phone in this $100 price range. Out of the box, after the Android OS is installed, you get around 58 gigs gigabytes left for you to download other applications and take photos with. The top here features a standard 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, always nice to see, and the other side features the traditional volume controls and a power key. The very bottom here does use USB Type-C for charging, supporting up to 10 watts for the charging speed. And speaking of, the phone houses a 5,130 milliamp hour capacity battery, which is gigantic. But because of the plastic uh, body that they're using here, it doesn't feel too heavy either, which is good as I was able to get easily two or three days of continuous usage before I had to recharge it again, although a full recharge will take around three hours to complete. Despite the low price, we do still have a fingerprint scanner on the rear, which is always welcome, along with the camera array, inclusive of a 30 megapixel main camera. There is a 8 megapixel ultra wide angle lens, which is 120 degrees, allows you to capture more within one shot, and there's also a 2 megapixel bokeh depth sensing camera. Finally, Finally, on the bottom here, there is an infrared thermometer that is one of the more unique hardware features of the A9. As we're still in the midst of a pandemic, it is an interesting function here that you can point at someone's forehead to record their temperature, as well as even measure the temperature of other objects like food. So as a whole, I think the design remains attractive, it's simple, and again, the playful colors overall is a nice touch. Now underneath the hood, the phone is running on a MediaTek Helio G25 processor. It's one of their newest chipsets here in 2021, and it is clocked up to 2 gigahertz, and it's a competitor to the likes of other more entry-level chipsets from Qualcomm, such as the Snapdragon 400 or some of the more light 600 series chips. So it's by no means going to be a powerhouse, but the performance is much improved compared to previous generation phones uh, in this price range. And overall, in terms of main navigation, everything does feel still pretty smooth and responsive. It's also backed up with 3GB of RAM, which for a 
budget phone I think is still acceptable here in 2021. Otherwise, as we can see here, the fingerprint scanner does work decently, I'd say, and unlocks the phone within one or two attempts pretty quickly. Although if the phone's display is turned off and you are waking it up using the fingerprint scanner, sometimes it takes a moment or two longer compared to a more expensive flagship phone. But as a whole, the sensitivity remains good. The UI and software here is super clean, as we talked about in our unboxing. It's pretty much a vanilla, unsolicited version of Android 11, which is currently the most up-to-date version available, which is great and also remains the only Android 11 based smartphone from Umidigi at the moment. We've got support for the newsfeed on the left and otherwise it also has the assistant. So if we say, okay, Google, depending on our voice, it will be able to recognize that and begin to search what we are trying to say to do a quick search or help us perform a command. There's access to the typical Google apps pre-installed, inclusive of YouTube, Drive, Photos, Maps, so on and so forth. The phone does have the typical GPS, as well as Bluetooth 5.0 built on in as well. Wi-Fi bands does support both 2.4G and 5G, as expected for most modern phones. More specifically under settings, as we talked about in our unboxing, you can also do things like remap the smart key on the side to open up different applications by single, double, or long pressing. And you can also take a closer look at other properties like gestures, as well as taking a closer look at any software updates or really firmware updates that sometimes are pushed over as well uh, from Umidigi that uh, typically provide some more stability or improvements in camera, things like that. So talking a little bit more about this display quality here, as a whole, even though it's a slightly lower resolution panel, I still find it to be more than acceptable for a budget phone. And in terms of being able to view back colors, they do look quite punchy and saturated, as you can see there. And uh, overall, again, giving us pretty good viewing angles as well. No real complaints uh, for the price range. and helps the phone also achieve its longer battery life and slightly faster frame rates and animations as well. Well, very rarely even gets hot or warm, never really thermal throttles or anything like that. So let's take a closer look at the performance of the camera next. The A9 does support some AI scene recognition functions, so like some other flagship devices, it can recognize between 13 different objects, and depending on what you're pointing it at, it will adjust the photo properties automatically to try and get you the best colors and shot. And if you want to use the bokeh effect, simply go over to portrait. It will then tell you to then point it at an object or a person that is at least a few centimeters away. And afterwards, you can also control how much of the bokeh you want. So for example, if you want to set it at a very strong strength, it will try and blur out the background more. Under extra, there is also a night mode, although the camera doesn't have optical image stabilization. So it still remains something that you have to hold very still to capture an image, but tries to bump up the aperture. And there's also a pro mode that gives you some more manual control over things like ISO. In terms of video recording, it's not quite as impressive as the photos overall, uh, since it is locked at maximum full HD or 1080p resolution. So unfortunately, we don't have the ability to record in 4K, but as a whole, it still is decent if you want to just record some short clips. Here's an example of a shot that was captured using the primary 13 megapixel lens with HDR turned on, and overall, it's pretty decent looking for a budget smartphone, I have to say. Colors do look pretty accurate, it's captured some of the details in the clouds and the colors are retained, not really blown out or washed out on this cloudy day and overall looking quite pleasant. Now photos after you take a snap may take a second or two to process in the background. So it's not the fastest again in, compared to a flagship. But again, for the price range, I think it's more than acceptable. Now here's the same shot without moving using the wide angle lens. You can see how much more content you're able to fill standing in the same spot. Uh, the wide angle lens though doesn't have as much many features like HDR. However, it still looks pretty accurate. It's just the colors might not be quite as popping or vibrant. Um, and the resolution is a little bit lower at eight megapixels, but can still be quite useful to sometimes play around with and get you a more immersive view. You can also take advantage of some of Google Photos um, properties to automatically brighten up certain images and uh, be able to adjust things using the software later on. Camera performance here is not going to kill an iPhone or a flagship like a Pixel it is still much improved compared to past generation budget smartphones. And to be completely honest, especially in brighter environments, the overall quality that you're getting here is pretty good for the price range. Next function I want to talk about briefly is the thermometer. Again, that is one of the more unique hardware features of Umidigi's newer phones at the moment that none of the other manufacturers that I'm aware of has implemented yet. It recommends pointing the sensor at your forehead, but you can also try it on your wrist area. Uh, that's also another place that typically gets a pretty good measurement. 
Overall, it's functional, but sometimes it can be a little finicky on the software side. You may have to tap once or twice to get a measurement. But uh, here was one out that I tried earlier, just pointing at my hand, and it measured the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. You can also tap once to switch into degrees Celsius. And there's also a dial here that expresses the range. So if you're green, you're in the healthy zone. If it's in the yellow, it might be warning. Red is you definitely have a fever and you should seek medical attention. There's also the object measurement mode, so you can pointed at something else to uh, measure its ambient temperature. For example, just this box should be pretty cold, but if we try it out here, you can see it's, it will measure in a few seconds. And you can also see the saved records as well on the last tab and uh, kind of take a look at the fluctuations in temperature. So general remarks is just keep the sensor clean and it will usually function. Now let's take a closer look at the experience just watching a YouTube video and take a listen at the speaker quality next. Overall takeaway is the quality of the speaker is decent, I would say. It's at least clean, doesn't really distort, at least it is in place on the rear, so it doesn't get muffled quite as easily, and the fact that we still have a regular headphone jack is always a plus if you want to try a regular pair of headphones or use the Bluetooth to connect to wireless buds as well. And for the most part, again, the screen remains quite immersive when it comes to looking back at media, and again, viewing angles are quite good. Uh, when you're looking at it from a kind of arm's length, everything is still quite beautiful, and for the most part, again, colors do come across very nice very immersive to use. Now interestingly from YouTube you can even crank the resolution of the video all the way up to full HD or 1080p despite the fact that the resolution of the screen is just a touch higher than 720. I can scrub between parts of the video. Everything loads up quite well also thanks to the rather strong reception quality of the Wi-Fi antenna thanks to the polycarbonate plastic housing here perform pretty quickly when it comes to loading back media whether it's YouTube or Netflix or also for browsing the web. We can do something like load up a different page and everything will still work just fine. The Gboard keyboard here is also very stock and supports things like swipe as well. So if we try loading back something like The Verge, let's see how it does. It's a slightly more complex site, so it should take just a second or two for it to fully open. Uh, but as a whole, still is doing quite well. Maybe it's not instantaneous compared to, say, a flagship smartphone, but still is more than good enough when it comes to not feeling annoyed uh, by the performance. Pinch to zoom gestures also work without really any complaints. We can try even loading up, let's say, a third tab and see how it handles that if we jump into something like, say, Amazon. In fact, let's demand the desktop version of the site to see if it can handle that. And once again, no real complaints, maybe a split second of hesitation sometimes, but by no means does that really detract from the overall experience or usability of the phone. And again, with three tabs, it can still jump back and forth between these pages really without reloading anything. A few other comments here on the performance of things like the call quality. It is also quite strong. Microphone does a good job of picking up your voice. When I was making some test phone calls earlier, people said they could hear me loud and clear. Otherwise, in terms of the performance with gaming, that's really the last element here, I would say it also handles itself decently. Again, keeping in mind that this is really a entry-level slash mid-tier uh, performance for the processor. Playing back more entry-level games, it doesn't have too much demanding graphics or things like that. You can see how it, they still load up relatively quickly, and the refresh rate for the screen is still pretty strong as well, without too much um, issues or glitches or slowdowns. So definitely playable for uh, lighter games in general, even for games which are slightly more demanding on the processing or GPU, it still does all right as well. Maybe it will take a split second lo longer to actually open up the game for the first time, uh, but as a whole, after you are open, you can see how the motions are still relatively smooth and responsive, even as we are playing along here without too much complaints, um, and everything still feels quite good. Of, of course, it's helped by the fact that the screen is slightly lower resolution, and again, it never really thermal throttles at least, so the phone never gets too hot or uncomfortable as you're holding it. The massive battery does mean you can game for quite 
quite a while before the battery even drains or depletes. That is more or less it as far as our hands-on review of the Yumadigi A9, which once again showing us how the value of budget phones are just getting better and better, and that you don't really need to spend an arm or a leg to get a solid performing phone anymore. It may not be a flagship killer, but it certainly is a rival to other budget phones such as Samsung's Galaxy A series, this one perhaps even having slightly better value gifted to a child or teenager, or even for personal use if you don't need something that has the fastest performance for, say, gaming. All you need to do is basic tasks like calling as well as watching videos. This will more than suffice. So you can check out more details again if you're interested in the links below, but for now that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been the Yumadigi A9.